it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Tonight's story is a follow-up to a video I did a couple of weeks ago called Seven Souls by Ringo Kratz. Now, it's not necessary to have listened to that one before hearing this, but as things go, it might make more sense if you have done. So, here we go with Seven Souls, the story of Emma Summers by Ringo Kratz. File number 177. Greetings. My name's Special Agent Michelle Harris. I work for a relatively unknown agency called the Department of Paranormal Investigations, or DPI for short. And technically, we fall under the Department of Homeland Security's sphere of influence. However, due to the secretive nature of our work, you won't find us on any DHS organizational charts. Most of our contributions to this great nation have gone completely unnoticed by the public at large. Well, we prefer it that way and do our best to keep as many civilians in the dark as possible. If the public knew what really went on behind closed doors when it came to the inner workings of power and paranormal phenomena, well, it would lead to what we at the agency have determined to be the greatest threat to national security, a mass uprising against the new world order. I've seen quite a few things in my time at DPI. Most of these things I've been able to compartmentalize or eventually rationalize away as necessary evils. But a few of my cases really stick out in my mind. Not for their uniqueness or cruelty, but for various reasons specific to me. Reasons I'm sure I'll highlight as time progresses and I detail more and more of these special cases. A brief summary on my background. I have a bachelor's in psychology from Georgetown University. After obtaining my degree, I spent three years in the APD as a police officer. I was recruited by DHS a little under five years ago to work in their newly minted DPI division. The training program to become a DPI special agent is extensive. I can't go into the details, but I was one of the first recruits to ever graduate. I spent the last two and a half years working with my partner, Agent Adams. He seems like a decent enough person. I often get a strange vibe when I'm around him. Something about him doesn't add up from a psychological standpoint. He seems overqualified for the position of special agent. I tried to find out more about him, but his entire past is redacted, even to DPI personnel, which is highly unusual. I've learned bits and pieces here and there, but his story is one for another day. Now, as I emphasized earlier, the vast majority of our work is highly classified. I say this because anyone reading this either has a high enough security clearance, or something in the future has gone terribly wrong, and yes, there are security levels above top secret. Three, to be exact. I know I'm all over the place and my report is extremely informal. Oh, back to my history, I grew up in a small town in Ohio, about 40 miles from Cleveland. When I was 17, something strange, something paranormal, I guess you can say, led me on the path to becoming a DPI agent. It's a difficult topic to broach, but the event in question tore my family apart and opened my eyes to a couple of worlds I never knew existed. The worlds of paranormal phenomenon and tragedy. My motivation for creating these unofficial reports is to touch on as many of these cases as possible that have been deemed redundant and forgotten about by my department. I'll file this report and all future ones like it under the non-essential category within our internal database. And the case I'll be examining today is the disappearance of an 18-year-old girl named Emma Summers. She went missing on the very same night she returned home from college, which was on May 11, 2019. My partner, Agent Adams, and I were assigned to the case by our field coordinator after one of the resource specialists flagged it as a PEP, which is code for Possible Extraordinary Phenomena. I was confused at first as to why we'd been assigned to a missing persons case, but after thumbing through her file, I could see why it was flagged for investigation. There was a method to our department's madness, and there were several reasons why a case could wind up on my desk. We look for things, subtle clues law enforcement is not privy to. My department has this silly saying, it's easy to see, but impossible to seek. The saying comes from two things. 
The way supernatural phenomenon plays upon the mind, and the way those who don't know what to look for usually miss things that are right in front of them. We started our investigation off by interviewing the parents. Standard operating procedure dictates that we disclose only that we work for DHS, not the DPI division, unless the interviewees are already part of the occult, have proper security clearance, are essential personnel, or civilians critical to the mission itself. Now, CCs, or critical civilians, were usually only given classified or sensitive information on a need-to-know basis. For reasons that should be obvious, we try to keep CCs to a minimum. Uh, the interview took place on May 23, 2019, in Southfield, Michigan. Southfield was one of the first and most heavily populated suburbs of Detroit. The interview was conducted at 0900 hours, in the living room of her parents' home. Emma's father, Perry Summers, came off as stern but fair. Her mother, Suzanne Summers, was a wreck. She spent most of the interview either sobbing or obsessing over the coffee and treats that she prepared for us. I could tell that the disappearance of their daughter weighed mightily upon them, like it would any mother or father whose child had suddenly gone missing. Her parents seemed like the typical Midwestern folks, hardy, hard-working, and down-to-earth. As explained by them, Emma was a pious, happy 18-year-old who had just returned home from college for summer break. We knocked on her bedroom door the following morning, around 0700 hours, and got no response. They found this odd because Emma was always punctual. Plus, the night before, they'd all agreed to wake up an hour early just so they could make breakfast together as a family before heading off to church for morning service. Emma's father managed to persuade her mother that her not answering the door wasn't that big of a deal. He figured she was probably still tired from the long drive home, considering she didn't get back until late last night. They could all make breakfast together some other time. There'd be plenty of chances. And she was home on summer break, after all. With that in mind, the two of them headed downstairs and began preparing breakfast. They thought it'd be a nice way of welcoming her back home, since all Emma would have to do when she woke up was head downstairs, grab a seat at the table, and enjoy a family meal before they all got ready for church service. Her mother headed back upstairs and knocked on her door around 08.30 hours. There was still no response. A bit annoyed by this, she tried to enter her room, but the door was locked. This set off alarm bells in her mother's head because Emma never locked her door unless she was changing. But she would have known this because she would have heard noise coming from upstairs, like Emma's footsteps and the TV playing or bathroom shower running. Her mother was in full panic mode. She pounded on her door and screamed for her to say something. Thinking fast, she ran to their bedroom and grabbed the spare key. When she opened the door, there was no sign of her. She'd seemingly vanished without a trace. There weren't any obvious signs of foul play, like an open window, a knocked-over chair, or a disheveled drawer. Their first thought was that maybe she'd snuck out in the middle of the night. Her purse, phone, and wallet were missing, which gave the police's theory credence that she'd left of her own volition. The case was odd. I'll give her parents that. They even claimed that they never heard so much as a peep from her room, like nothing. She went to bed and was gone the following morning without a trace. Well, they didn't do much of anything at first. I'm thinking they figured out that she'd come home and the whole thing would just blow over. But that never happened. And after several hours of waiting around, trying to figure out what to do, they decided to start searching for her. They drove up and down the neighborhood, called her college campus, friends and relatives, to see if, by some miracle, she was with one of them. Around 20 hundred hours... Her parents made their way down to the local police station and tried to file a missing persons report. Well, the police told them it was too early, and they had to wait at least 24 hours before they could file. Ah, the whole 24-hour waiting period. It absolutely drives me crazy every time I hear this. There was no set amount of time one must wait before filing a missing persons report. Their excuse was, and I quote, It's Sunday, and... Nothing's going to take place as far as an investigation goes till Monday. You guys would be better off coming back tomorrow. Even when they returned the following Monday, as told, May 13th, 2019, the police treated her case more like a runaway than a missing person. To say that local law enforcement didn't take her disappearance seriously would be an understatement. 
In their eyes, she was a young girl who was probably just wanting to get away from her overbearing parents and their conservative rules. They even went so far as to tell her parents that this kind of thing was common and they shouldn't worry. Which is true to a certain extent. A shocking amount of people go missing each year, and the vast majority are either found or return home within 24 hours. However, with that being stated, I'm amazed that the public still hasn't caught on. I mean, a significant number of unsolved disappearances are vampire-related. Even our department rarely investigates missing persons cases. The term had even become something of a misnomer in our department. The fastest way to waste your time was to investigate a missing persons case. Usually, the missing person in question was a victim that had died at the hands of a starving vampire. And this case was different. The pattern was eerily similar to some of our legacy investigations. These were well-established cases that had been handed over to our department by the CIA. Legacy investigations were a big part of the reason DPI was formed. This was why me and my partner had been assigned to this case. DPI leadership wanted to know why she'd been abducted. Well, the interview went about as well as I'd expected. Emma's parents talked more about how amazing she was than about the possible crime in question. Though I did agree, I mean, Emma had no reason to run away. There was definitely foul play involved in her disappearance. Her parents seemed like genuinely good people, and Emma did seem like the cliché girl next door they painted her out to be. That's why the only real breakthrough came when her parents gave us permission to do an informal search of her bedroom. Emma may be a good girl, but I knew that most parents never really knew what their kids were up to when they weren't around. I knew her bedroom would probably be the best chance we had at finding any evidence that would lead to solving the case. So them allowing us to snoop around was big. They told us that her room had been left just like it was on the morning she'd gone missing. Her room was like any typical teenage girl's room. Again, it seemed like Emma's parents were spot on in their assessment. She was as close as you could get to the perfect child. Her room was immaculate and lacked anything that could be considered out of the way or inappropriate. Even her diary lacked the private indecencies you'd expect. Local law enforcement really dropped the ball on this one. Even though there was no sign of foul play, I couldn't help but feel like her case had slipped through the cracks. I know adults were entitled to go wherever they pleased without having to check with their parents first, and to their credit, they did promise to assign a detective to the case if she didn't return home or continued not to make any meaningful attempts to contact them. Well, they were convinced that the pressure of college combined with her strict upbringing had finally gotten the best of her. They told her parents that Emma just wanted to get away, and that I quote, Kids do stuff like this all the time. She's probably down in Cancun with her friends, having the time of her life. Or maybe she's with some guy she met in college. This was local law enforcement's proposal. Not only were their ideas nonsensical, but they were completely out of character for her. Emma was a bright girl who had a bright future ahead of her. She was smart, well-liked, and deeply pious. She had no reason to run away. But again, I understand the Southfield Police Department's logic. She was an adult who wanted her freedom. She'd probably grown tired of her parents' strict, overbearing nature. They probably pressured her into returning home for summer break, when all she really wanted to do was get away for a while and be with her friends. The idea wasn't as crazy as it sounds, and I'm sure they've seen crazier things. Southfield was a big city. They had more pressing cases to solve. Even for our department, this was probably the fastest missing persons case to ever reach my desk. And again, we rarely investigated missing persons cases. Well, the department quickly realized all missing person meant was that the person in question had been hunted down and slain by a group of starving vampires. And so, to have her shoot past the usual counter checks, and as fast as it did, was very unusual. Our lab techs and field analysts were some of the best in the world, so if they flagged her disappearance as a pep, then there had to be a reason for it. The search did not bear much fruit at first. The only break in the case came when I searched her Facebook page. Luckily, her parents knew the password to her laptop, and she never logged out of her Facebook profile, so I was able to go through her messages. 
Again, everything was vanilla, except for this one exchange with a gentleman named Eric Weinblatt. I almost missed the significance of their private exchange because their conversation seemed pretty innocuous at first. What made me look a bit closer was the name Weinblatt itself. It wasn't a coincidence. The term literally meant wine mixed with human blood of a certain caliber. A robust class of aristocratic vampires indulged in this delicacy quite often. Something of a sport and sign of prestige. Anybody who was anybody wouldn't be caught dead without a stupidly expensive bottle of wine blood in their cellar. If you were worth your salt in their strange little vampire bubble, that is. Emma and this Mr. Wineblood exchanged several messages about a month ago. It seems he was trying to convince her to meet him in person, but it didn't work. In fact, their conversation was brief. She pretty much told him to leave her alone and that she wasn't interested in whatever craziness he was selling. At first, their exchange came off as the typical, creepy tactics vampires resorted to when hunting for human victims. But the more I read into his words the more and more it seemed like he was trying to recruit her for something more nefarious than that. Part 2 Two questions stood out the most. The first was if she was religious. The second was if she'd ever lain with a man. I remember having this bad feeling. No matter how hard I tried, the thought of him harming Emma just wouldn't go away. Well, I followed my gut instinct and had my partner take a look. I was hoping he'd tell me I was crazy, but his reaction did more to justify my worries than it did to put them at ease. He asked me to click on Mr. Wineblood's picture, and when he saw him, he seemed genuinely surprised, but not in a good way. It was more in the, oh, we have some unfinished business kind of way. With them already having history, Tracking down this Mr. Wineblood proved to be the easy part. The hard part was getting my partner to relinquish any details regarding how he knew this vampire. During the entire car ride, mind you, a destination he kept hidden from me, he kept insisting that this case would be another good introduction into how crappy of a career choice I had made. My partner was the irritable Agent Adams, after all. He was known for his legendary sarcasm, so of course I took what he said with a grain of salt. I do remember eventually responding by saying that my career choice couldn't possibly be any worse than my choice in man. You got a kick out of that one. And even more so when I refused to elaborate any further on my non-existent social life. It took approximately 20 minutes to arrive at our destination. This was a place of particular interest to me. I'd only ever read about the anti-church up until now. His exterior was old and desolate. According to my studies, it was an intentional design choice. The less beautiful the facade was, the least likely it was to catch the attention of the wandering eye. Now, the history of the anti-church is long and complicated. To keep things short and uncomplicated, I'll state a few unclassified facts. The history of the anti-church goes all the way back to Lucifer's rebellion in heaven. He was at war with God for reasons that were a bit more complicated than we're told. Reasons I'll not get into because my report would be a hundred pages long. Suffice to say, he was defeated and judged for his crimes by God. Before he was sentenced to eternal damnation, he swore before the heavenly host that he would find a way to bring about the end times. He swore before his five fallen generals that together they shall fall and that together they shall rise and usher in a new faith that will topple the old faith. And this is where the anti-church comes into play. Vampires work with high-ranking human officials to spread and defend unholy doctrine, as well as to prepare for the supposed final battle. Well, there's quite a bit more to it, but again, this was the less complicated version. We entered the anti-church. The interior was nothing like the exterior. In fact, I was pretty blown away by what I saw. The walls inside the nave were lined with glimmering marble columns. Its floors were decorated in brilliant tarwork that looked like it had been handcrafted. There were several rows of pews, a black altar at the head of the apse, and at least three hallways within the arcade that led to God only knows where. 
We were escorted to the head priest's office. His position was called Pontifex. His job was to oversee day-to-day -day services and ceremonies. I couldn't believe it. Sitting right beside him was the vampire from Emma's Facebook messages. The two were at his desk, engaging in light-hearted conversation. They stopped when my partner, Agent Adams, made a sarcastic remark about how he thought he would never have to see Mr. Weinblood's ugly mug again, but that he should have probably known better. Mr. Weinblood returned my partner's disingenuous smile with a crooked smile of his own. He too remarked that the feeling was mutual. I'd had enough. I stepped up to detain this Mr. Weinblood for questioning, but to my surprise, my partner stopped me. When I protested, he told me that my decision would cause our department to lose face in the vampire underworld. Face we couldn't afford to lose since the department was still relatively new. It was a choice between a rock and a hard place. I chose the survival and continued autonomy of my own department over what would have been a very satisfying but brash detainment. I didn't really understand why at the time. In my mind, time was of the essence, and this creep obviously had something to do with Emma's disappearance. All he needed was a little push in the right direction, and he'd be more than angry to lead us to her. I was very disappointed in my partner. I thought we were on the same page. I thought he was willing to do whatever it took to rescue the good people from the bad people. I really wanted Emma to get home safely to her parents. The idea of putting her well-being second to anything else hadn't even crossed my mind until now. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And to make matters worse, during the interview with Emma's parents, I looked them in the eyes and promised to find their daughter. How was I supposed to go back on my word? How was I supposed to face them after that? Mr. Weinblood gave me a look of sympathy. He apologized and told us that he was only acting on behalf of his master. Agent Adams asked if the term master meant what he thought it meant. Mr. Weinblood nodded, yes, which annoyed my partner. He was always annoyed by something, that's just the type of person he was, but this seemed to get under his skin more than usual. So much so, he outright demanded to know the location of where the girl was being held. Mr. Weinblood turned to the pontifex, and the two began a secret conversation in what I assumed was Romanian. My partner butted in and warned them that they had an agreement. If they violated the terms of this agreement, he'd be forced to involve local vampiric authority. The two stopped whispering and conspiring when he said that. The pontifex cursed him for threatening to involve secular vampires into the affairs of the anti-church. He railed against their overseers, calling them non-believers who couldn't care less about bringing about the end times. My partner scoffed at this. He looked at his phone while the zealot raged on and began going through his contacts. Ah, uh, let me see. Ah, uh, there she is. The cold-blooded Countess Anne-Marie Bathory. I'll just go ahead and give her a dial on her private line. Yeah, I'm sure a demon order as non-believing as hers will appreciate this. The pontifex held up his hand, gesturing for him to hold on a minute. They then returned to whispering in Romanian to one another. The pontifex angry said a few final words to his counterpart before abruptly ending the conversation in frustration. Mr. Weinblood turned to Agent Adams and informed him that he would lead us to where Emma was being held. Before agreeing to take us, he strongly suggested that we not interfere with the process. He looked at me when he said it, which irked me to no end, but I agreed without hesitation. The only thing that mattered was finding her, not their convoluted schemes or archaic traditions. I may have told Mr. Weinblood I wouldn't intervene, but I insisted on following protocol. He was suspected of kidnapping. Our DPI regulations stipulated that he should be placed in handcuffs before being allowed into the back of our vehicle. Well, he resisted at first, but I persisted took my partner telling him to pretty much just go along with it before he backed down. He said, and I quote, ah, She's new and still learning the ins and outs of your world. The trip itself was long and disquieting. The only source of entertainment came from listening to my partner sing along to rock and roll oldies as if we were simply out running errands. He asked Mr. Weinblood several times if he liked a certain song, before eventually asking if he even appreciated the significance of old school rock. He was disappointed every time by Mr. Weinblood's responses, and completely beside himself when he admitted to not caring for the Grateful Dead's music at all. 
Oh, Mr. Weinblatt got a good kick out of my partner's threat to give him a good kick out of our moving vehicle. We drove all the way to central Michigan and soon found ourselves deep in cornfield territory. He took us to a very small farming town that was sandwiched between the cities of Saginaw and Midland, Michigan. The whole thing seemed sketchy. The only thing that kept me calm was the fact that my partner didn't seem to have a problem with it at all. He was having a merry old time, in fact, tormenting us with his dreadful singing. I shrugged and told myself he was a veteran of paranormal investigations. Everything had to be okay if he was this cheery. We arrived at our destination. He parked in front of this medium-sized barn that was pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. It looked like it had been recently built, which struck me as odd for a place that seemed so old. Before we exited from the vehicle, my partner informed Mr. Weinblood that he was bluffing when he told him that he had the Countess's phone number. Oh, this agitated Mr. Weinblood, but he quickly got over it. He told my partner that he'd figured as much. Mr. Weinblood led us to the entrance. He complained about the handcuffs, but I didn't care. There was no way I was letting him roam around without me being right behind him. I warned him that if he was leading us into a trap, I'd put a bullet in the back of his head. The barn door was guarded by a vampire called Acolyte. The lower half of his face was concealed under a black mask. He had on a pair of black BDU pants and a black BDU shirt. He was armed with a katana sword, which was sheathed to his back, and a silver 50 caliber pistol. Mr. Weinblood ordered him to open the door. He agreed, but with a bit of reluctance. He eased his fears by stating that we were the newly minted Observation Department. I found out much later that this was the name vampires used when referring to us. It was in fact rare for them to call us by our official name unless they were trying to be polite. They saw us as more of a nuisance than anything else. He slid the massive barn door open. The first thing that caught my eye was the sight of a young girl chained to a massive black arch on the other end of the room. It was impossible to miss. Candles lined the entrance on both sides, forming an aisle that illuminated the darkness as well as forming a direct path to the girl. Her arms were raised and bound by a pair of manacles to the top of the giant arch. Her ankles were secured to the floor by shackles. Silence ruled the day and made her suffering seem that much worse. The clanging of iron rang through my ears like the sound of screams every time she struggled to break free from her chains. A pair of vampires, dressed in religious attire, stood in front of the petrified girl. I could tell by her long blonde hair and blue eyes that it was Emma. Oh, the sight sickened me, but I tried my best to remain professional. All I wanted to do in that moment was rush over and undo her chains. Even to this day, I feel like a coward. I wanted to save her, but instead I placed the legitimacy of our organization over doing what was right. I've worked for the Department of Paranormal Investigations for well over four years now, and in that time span I've seen a lot of things I wish I could unsee. The hardest challenge for me was to be watching innocent people suffer. It's probably something I don't think I'll ever be able to be comfortable with, even if by some miracle I retire from the department after seeing God knows what else. My biggest fear is becoming like my partner, Agent Adams. His time at the department and experiences with the supernatural have caused him to become a deeply jaded individual. As a psychologist, I can say with certainty that becoming apathetic, or even worse, comfortable with the suffering of others, is a clear line that delineates those with psychopathic traits from the rest of us. My immediate, visceral response to witnessing others experience great pain or hardship is hard to summarize, it reminded me of that queasy feeling I get in my gut whenever I'm unlucky enough to hear someone who's in mortal danger call out to God for protection and salvation. Two acolytes stepped before Emma and ripped her clothes off. She was alone, scared, and begging them for answers. Well, I couldn't take it anymore. I turned away for a moment when she begged God for salvation. The fear in her eyes spoke to me in a way that still haunts me to this day. Oh, nightmares and sleepless nights are to be expected when you choose such a grim profession, I suppose. A tall, striking woman, wearing a pristine white stola with gold trim, approached the desperate girl. She caressed the side of her face and told her that she was loved. She told her that she was serving a higher purpose. 
while Emma begged and pleaded with her again and again. The priestess ignored her cries and began to wash her face with a damp cloth. Unpolluted water would be enough to purify her soul, or so she was told. She tried to reassure Emma that her sacrifice was not in vain, for it was a great honour to serve as a host for one of their fallen lords. She seemed genuine in her care for the girl. Mr. Weinblood led us toward the stairs that led to the gallery on the right-hand side of the barn. We were stopped midway into our march by the appearance of what I know now to be one of the three members of the Tormented. He was dressed in all black and wore an iron mask. He practically came out of nowhere, and he just stood there watching us, silent and still as stone. What compelled me to dig deep into DPI archives in an effort to find out more about these so-called tormented was my partner's visceral reaction. This was the only time I've ever seen Agent Adams visibly shaken. He quickly stuttered out to this thing that we were only here as witnesses via World Order Agreement. It vanished shortly after my partner had spoken. And when I say vanished, I mean this thing melded into the ground like a shadow melding into the darkness. It was surreal. At the time I figured it was a parlour trick, but my digging revealed a truth that was more terrible than I'd imagined. They were part of a radical sect within the anti-church called the Black Church. These freaks took the idea of suffering and torment literally. There's still a great deal about them that's unknown, and several requests for more information on their doctrinal practices have been made by our department, and all of our inquiries have been dismissed out of hand by anti-church authorities. I tried to get my partner to tell me what he knew about the Black Church, but these conversations never led anywhere. I remember asking him at the time and seeing Mr. Weinblood find my bewilderment amusing. I gave him a shove up the steps when he teasingly chided my partner for not addressing my concerns. We finished walking up the stairs and made a left, taking up position on the right-hand side. We were not close, but his choice in position granted us an ideal vantage point of the spectacle that unfolded on the first floor. The priestess purified Emma's face with a cloth one last time. She handed the stone basin to an acolyte standing nearby, who in turn placed it atop a lectern cabinet. The priestess lowered her hands and asked that this vestal before them be accepted as a worthy offering, and for her to be embraced by the fire. The whole time Emma was crying and screaming. She kept asking the priestess what was happening to her. A priest called a Thaumaturge came before Emma and the priestess. He was wearing a black cassock with red trim and sleeves. The priestess informed him that the girl had been cleansed and was ready to be taken by the fire. Well, Emma cried and pleaded no. She begged the Thaumaturge to stop when he began reading aloud in Romanian from a tome. He swung a gold burner back and forth, filling the barn with a bitter-smelling frankincense. The smoke made Emma cough and choke until she passed out. He stopped swinging the burner once his spell had taken hold, and then stepped back until he was standing next to the priestess. The two of them bowed their heads and began to ask for Emma's safe passage in the flames, and for their fallen lord's safe passage out of the flames. A vampire wearing a dark hooded robe entered the barn. I later found out that he was a high-ranking war priest called a warlock. Each branch of the anti-church had their warlock, and they oversaw the acolytes and thaumaturges for an entire branch division. They also performed any rituals within their assigned territory that were critical to the new faith's overarching mission. He slinked over to the girl and stood in front of her for a moment, like a snake stalking a mouse. He raised her chin up and began examining her for flaws. Seeing none, he muttered something in Romanian which pleased the priestess. Two acolytes stood before him. The first was holding what appeared to be a black ciborium. The second was clutching a wooden chalice filled to the brim with wine. The warlock shouted a spell in Romanian, and his words were as powerful and booming as a sound wave. The force struck her in the face like a gust of wind and the suddenness snapped Emma out of her trance. She looked into his eyes and screamed. He placed his bony index finger to her lips and shushed her, warning her not to fear the coming fire. Her eyes glazed over. His unnatural, serpentine tone hypnotized her. 
He demanded that she state her name, and she muttered, Emma, Emma Summers. Pleased by this, he then asked her for her age and religion, and she uttered, Eighteen, Catholic. I could tell that she was completely out of it by the way she soullessly droned her responses. The warlock was pleased with himself and took a moment to give praise to the new faith for this black blessing. Then he took what appeared to be bread from the ciborium and placed it into her mouth. After she had slowly finished chewing, he took the wooden cup and forced her to drink from it. I later found out that he'd given her what the anti-church called unholy communion. The history is odd but fascinating. It revolves around Lucifer and his unholy transubstantiation during his rebellion against God. Those who were true believers, as they called it, believed that Lucifer's hatred for God was more than just an emotion that had inspired an unsuccessful rebellion. It was transformative in nature. His desire for a new order caused a mutation. He transformed from the glorious angel of light into the very first demon. Even though he's considered the first demon, our department has tagged him under the Fallen Angel category in our research database. This is still a topic of much contention within the agency, with many subscribing to follow traditional canon, which portrays him as something far removed from an angel. Part 3 The warlock caressed the side of her face. She stared blankly at him, still spellbound by whatever black magic he'd incorporated into her agency. He lowered his hood. His face was ancient and wrinkled to the point of looking inhuman. It was pale, gaunt, and leathery like serpent skin. He pushed Emma's head back and shouted, I release you. It was strange. His words seemed to ripple through her body like a pulsation. I can't say for sure, but I swear I could hear her heartbeat. It sounded clear and distinct, almost as if he'd placed my ear to her chest. I don't know if I was hearing things at the time or not, but I do know for a fact that his words caused her to return to her previous state of unconsciousness. The warlock backed away while pulling a ceremonial dagger from his sleeve. He used it to cut a cross into the palm of his hand. He allowed the blood to drip onto the dirt floor as he incanted a spell in Romanian. His voice was quiet but thunderous. The ground shook more and more, as if the vile black words he spoke had awakened the underworld. He collapsed to a knee, dropping the dagger in utter exhaustion. Blood was as dense and greasy as oil and slipped from his mouth. He raised his old shaky hand and spoke. It's hour of blood. Blood of hate, unlock your malefic gate. I call forth malevolence and cast away benevolence. I call upon true evil, let the Lord of Darkness live. Your power transcends time, let the void of fire and darkness emit. Upon heaven and earth your name is reviled. Take hold of this soul I shall deliver. Or he would have you leash forever to faith like a dog. I pray the shackles branded onto thy flesh by the word of God. The warlock then grimaced. He gripped his chest and snarled and snapped. He soldiered through the pain and called out to whatever entity he was invoking with the words, I unbind this vessel from its mortal living coil. Now bind our vessel to its immortal unliving coil. He cried out, I release you, again, but strangely nothing happened. He turned to the priestess and glowered at her with fury and anger. She quickly made her way over to the girl and wiped the blood from her nostrils. The priestess then returned to her position next to the thaumaturge and bowed her head. The warlock raised his blood-drenched hand and again shouted the words, I release you. He slammed his hand onto the ground and the floor around them rumbled. Let there be darkness, he commanded. The entire room went pitch black. Souls screaming in torment rang through my ears. I could feel the pain from the fire that burned and scorched the endless mass of sinners who had died and been damned for all eternity. 
moment may have only lasted for a few seconds, but it was long enough to drive me to breaking point. Well, there are no words to describe it. I don't know what I would have done if that moment would have lasted any longer. It made me question whether I'd made the right choice by joining the Department of Paranormal Investigation. And I jeopardized my soul. I only wanted to understand the true nature of evil so I could understand why terrible things happen to good people like my sister. Our mission as DPI agents is to provide the executive branch with as much information as possible on evil. But what if I was wrong? What if our mission statement was a lie used to luring people like me? I'd have damned myself with my foolish choice to join the agency. How could God allow me to suffer for all eternity for my mistake? The thought was almost as tormenting as the fire and screams of hell. Even to this day, the thought torments me quite a bit. The darkness faded. I looked over at Emma and noticed something strange and unfamiliar happening to her body. She was... She was transforming, slowly but surely, into a new, whole being. Her long blonde hair turned black. Her petite frame morphed into a masculine one. All the innocent details that made her who she was were erased and replaced with features of a more sinister character. The chains and shackles binding this newly formed being rattled when he moved his arms and legs for the first time. Wind and rain shook the barn as it began to violently thunderstorm. The being opened his eyes and gasped for air. He glanced around in a calm manner, taking stock of the situation. Thaumaturge motioned for a group of acolytes to quickly come and unchain him. The Thaumaturge then bowed his head and handed him a purple shawl once they'd freed him. None of the sycophants in his presence dared to look at him until he'd finished dressing himself in the robe. He rubbed his bruised wrist and wondered aloud why his shackles had been so tight. It was only a human they'd bound to the gates of hell, after all. Majorly annoyed by this, he looked around the barn and called out for Eric. He made a snide remark that perhaps he would have some answers for him while waiting. Agent Adams looked over at Mr. Wineblood and then at me. He gave me one of those looks a veteran gives someone who's new to the job. Knowing full well this was not the time to ask questions, I hurriedly uncuffed him, and the three of us made our way towards the being who had beckoned him. He studied us with narrowing eyes as we came uncomfortably close. He ordered one of his sycophants to bring him a towel. He snapped his fingers and demanded one of the acolytes, who was just standing around, staring at him in awe, help the warlock to his feet. His last command before he turned his attention to us was for someone to clean up this mess, referring to all the loose ends strewn about that had been part of the four byproducts of the ritual. He tightened his shawl a bit before angrily wiping the blood from his nostrils. He examined the blood on his fingers before asking Eric, Did the girl suffer? Mr. Wineblood shook his head, no. The being responded by saying, Good. Then he turned to me and my partner and said, I uh, wasn't expecting any company. Mr. Wineblood introduced this being to us as Lord Haven. Before either one of us could say anything, he smirked and stated that he was already acquainted with Mr. Adams. He extended his hand out for me to shake and said something along the lines of, You must be new. I can remember myself being a bit taken by the moment. Enough so, I barely managed to ask him, Are you a fallen angel? Without stumbling over my words. And when he said, Yes, I just stood there for a moment, stunned. He was human in appearance, but those dark eyes, yeah, they gave it away. And it wasn't just that, it was everything about him. He stood at least a foot taller than any of us. He was striking for someone who'd done the unthinkable and rebelled against God. I would have mistaken him for a model if he were anywhere but here. His presence was commanding and demanding. The way he comported himself was cruel yet debonair. I found myself mesmerized by his supernatural beauty and uncanny charm. Oh, you can have your hand back, Michelle, he said with a smirk, snapping me out of my daze. Oh, God, sorry, I exhaled. God, he asked. Wait. How did you... Know your name? Yeah. 
We do have access to the internet. It's not all fire and brimstone down under. Really? I asked. Yeah, I'm Australian. You are? I asked. I'm joking. I was speechless. He was this fallen angel who'd suffered worse than I could ever imagine, making light of his plight. Seeing how I wasn't about to do it, he let go of my hand and turned his attention to my partner. Before shaking hands, he said to Agent Adams, Good evening, old friend. I was confused by the fact that he'd just called my partner an old friend. But then he made a comment which threw me for a loop about him starting to make a bit of a habit of being present when he was vulnerable. His rather off-coloured remark about the Archangel Michael and how my partner wasn't much of assistance really caught me off guard. Seeing my bewildered expression, he explained that Agent Adams was there to witness his triumphant defeat at the hands of Michael. He also made a point to state how much things had changed since he was gone. Back then, Agent Adams was the curious, doe-eyed detective and his partner, the seasoned CIA field agent. If you're wondering why I died, it was retaliation for interfering in heavenly affairs. The fight itself wasn't exactly fair, considering we lack our true strength while bound to this mortal shell, unlike the God-fearing angels who don't seem to suffer from this problem. I remember asking what he meant by we when he'd said what he said. Were there more like him, and if so, where were they? Lord Haven brushed me off, with cavalier charm typical of him. He assured me that these were questions for another day, and that right now I should focus on learning as much as I could about my profession. I looked over at Mr. Wineblood, but before I could ask, he read my mind. Ah, oh, Eric, he's harmless. He's my lictor. All that means is he's basically my glorified church-sanctioned secretary. He dabbed his forehead with a towel and added, It's one of the few positions noble houses can hold in the seedy ranks of the anti-church. I remember being mightily offended when he called him harmless, so much so I failed to ask him to elaborate on the latter part of his statement. Now, after further study, I have somewhat of an idea what he meant by noble houses that serve the anti-church, but I'm afraid it's not enough to where I feel comfortable sharing the details. There was still so much left to uncover, and the anti-church was a very difficult organization to crack. I asked this Lord Haven what he meant about Eric being harmless, and if he considered luring young girls to their doom harmless. Lord Haven chuckled a bit. Oh, come on. Everything has a price. If it were that easy to escape, I imagine we'd rule the world by now. Is this what that was? The ritual passage? Yes. Well, hell didn't come exactly with an exit. So you have to sacrifice young girls then? I can be young males too. Well, we keep things above board and make sure they're 18. And yes, they are chaste and religious. It is a ritual after all. God, I have so many questions. And I have so many answers. Well, where do we even start? Ah, uh, not here, he told me. As you can probably imagine, I'm a very busy fallen angel. I must say I'm curious about you. I'll tell you what, after I tidy up my office, back at our department, I'll clear a spot on my schedule. That way we can have a more intimate encounter. As you humans like to say, we can share a glass of wine and pick each other's brain. Hmm, is that what you humans say? You'd think I'd know. I've certainly been around it all kind enough. Oh, wait. Um, our department? I asked. Oh, it's a long story. Oh, before I forget, thank you for not harming my lictor, Eric. I'm glad you listened to your partner concerning that. I know Agent Adams can be exasperating, but he's a good man. You'll do right to learn the ropes from him. Well, I was at a loss for words. can't remember what I said. I think it was okay or thank you, but again, I'm not sure. That was the last time I talked to Lord Haven. He never did clear a spot on his schedule. There's been a bit of small talk between Agent Adams and Lord Haven. He apologized for his lack of hospitality before having Eric shoo us away. That was it. The memory of Emma would have to live on through my final report. I didn't have to do one. In fact, my partner told me I was wasting my time writing something no one in the department would ever bother to read. Even though that may be true, 
Emma was a person she deserves better. She had a real life with hopes and dreams. She deserves to have a voice. She deserves to have her story told even if no one ever reads this. May the life and memory of Emma Summers live on. Well, this was my third case. Her death was almost as disturbing as the one in my very first case. There's another one in the department deemed unworthy of an official report. Well, this concludes my criminal report on the killing of Emma Summers. File number 177 in the Criminal Investigation Archives at the Department of Paranormal Investigations. No dossier number was assigned to this report. The subject matter was deemed redundant by my superiors. Special Agent Michelle Harris. Badge number 957-8823. April 4th. 2022. Okay, so not exactly a straight sequel to um, Seven Souls, but in the same universe, and I'm very, very happy about that. And it would seem that there's a lot more to come as well. Lots more possible stories to extend um, our time here. <laughs> Well, there you go, that's your Friday evening's entertainment. I know there was only a story yesterday, but I uh, needed more. Okay. Well, that's it. Have a lovely weekend, everyone. Back on Sunday, and um, I keep promising the end of the uh, meat locust, but I'm really getting around to it this time. Till then, my dear friends, have a great weekend, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.